Center for Transportation and University, at MIT. He's also the founder of the MIT Freight Lab. Prior to joining MIT, Dr. Kaplan um, held a uh, different management position in supply chain consulting firm. And he's also the chief scientist for chain analytics. The title of his presentation today is uh, Long Term Planning for Transportation, the Future Freight, those projects. So please help me to thank him for being here. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, Transportation MIT is a great initiative. Um, thank you for the introduction, Maita. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 40 or so minutes um, is a project that we just finished. It's called the Future Freight Flows Project. And it was something a little different than what we typically do at CTL. Typically, the Center for Transportation Logistics works in transportation logistics supply chain problems from the private sector's perspective, generally. Not always, but generally, we work with shippers and carriers. And so the idea for this project was actually to look at from the government side, from the planners, from the people building the infrastructure. So what we really wanted to focus on and what the project really pushed us for is the idea of transportation planning. Freight transportation planning is hard. It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. It's difficult to do from the shipper's perspective. I work with a lot of shippers on this because they're usually the tail at the end of the dog. A plan comes up, and they're expected to recover from it, to make sure things work. So they're usually the last one to know and the first one to be blamed. So in a survey that we did that actually, actually Dr. Bruce Arntzen ran about two years ago, surveyed about 1,500 people globally at different companies trying to understand how people react from, are they planners or are they responders? Do you plan ahead and you're really good at that, or are you someone who's really good at being flexible and reacting? And he did it from a scale from zero to four. Most people came in, and most companies came in at about a 1.5, a little on the planning side of things. One function, though, was above 2.5, transportation. We're responders. We're trained to be this. Anyone in transportation knows you're reacting more than you're planning. So it's hard to do planning here because you're subject to so many different things. It's even harder for carriers. These are the trucking companies, the railroads, the airlines, the barge lines, ocean uh, sh shippers. So the idea for these guys, not only do they have that last minute notification, they've got to make major investment decisions for their own capital uh, equipment and for their own, own, own materials. So it's even harder for them. But I would argue, and this was a surprise to me because I'm a private sector guy, is that it's even hardest for government. Someone has to make the planning. And there's many reasons. I have six right here. So let me just explain each of these. Uh, first is the time frame. Planning for infrastructure freight or passenger, anything for infrastructure, is decades in length. Uh, one of the most famous projects of the last quarter century or so is known as the Almeida Corridor. It uh, connects the port of uh, Long Beach in LA. It sinks 20 miles of railroad track so that there is no road crossing problems. This project was proposed and first planned in 1981, and the first traffic went through in 2002. 22 years it took. The big dig right across the way took over 25 years from inception to first car going through. And there's debate whether it's still finished. But the idea is that it takes decades to have these things go. So you're planning 25 years before you even start using it, and then it's got a 30-year lifespan. So you've got to try to plan 50 years out. Very different from a business that is generally looking at quarter, maybe year, maybe a couple years out. Diverse and vocal constituents. In a company, most people generally are in one line. They're trying to make profit and do certain things. For government, you've got these vocal constituents. And so NIMBY is kind of common, not in my backyard. People don't want to have a freight yard in their backyard or near their city. But then there's also the bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. And the idea is they're opposed to any kind of construction, anything for this. So that's another thing that the government planners have to face up against. The third is that pallets don't vote. There's more interest in converting rail um, track to trails than there is for putting an intermodal rail yard. Pallets, freight, is not really perceived high on the politician's scale of things. People are. People vote, pallets don't. So freight usually falls a little low on the, on the schedule of things. Also, the government tends to be the same place where, where industry was 30 years ago. They're modally and jurisdictionally siloed. What do I mean? In a company, you'll have someone in charge of transportation, and they'll have trucking, rail, all those things following under them. In the government, you have a trucking agency, you have a rail agency. Everything is siloed. Jurisdictional, you have things that are state or region or even a metropolitan area that are run separately. 
We all know that freight moves between these. So the fact that they're siloed geographically as well as organizationally is a real hindrance. And it's about where companies were 30 or so years ago. Um, revenue sources, the, the gas tax works great. Un unfortunately, we're getting more efficient, so we're using less. So that's a whole other talk it could be, but the revenue's going down. And system owners, this is one of the big ones, and the reason why this project was created, the users of the system tended not to talk to the owners of the system. So two major conferences that, are, that deal with this area. The Transportation Research Board, TRB, meets in January, and it's about 99% government and maybe 1% private sector. I can probably count on two hands the number of shippers and carriers that go to that conference. On the flip side, every fall there's the Council of Supply Chain Management that brings in an equal number of people, but they're all from the private sector, and they probably bring about 10 government. So they talk very different worlds, and they're really separated. And so this was recognized in the American Association of Highway Transportation Officials, which is essentially every state Department of Transportation, DOT, their president, their head, got together along with the National Cooperative Highway Research Program and started these 2083 projects. And so this project that I'm talking about today is the first of the 20-83 projects. And they're aimed to look at strategic things. And the first one was about freight. So what do we do with freight? They had two objectives. One, to help DOTs look beyond their normal planning. DOTs are staffed with engineers. It's great, I'm an engineer, right? But there are civil engineers that try to, you know, they build a highway, they build an overpass. We're trying to say, okay, let's step back. Let's look a little further. Let's have some critical analysis, think a little further. How can this project help them think beyond the requirements of today? The second is to try to get a better discussion going between the different people, the shippers and the carriers. That last point I had about why it's hard for government planners is try to get that to mix. How do we get those, encourage those discussions to happen at many different levels, national, multi-state, state, regional, MPO, uh, the whole gamut. So three key deliverables were um, set to come out from this project, and we're finished now. I'm just waiting for the final report comments to come back. First is to develop a bunch of scenarios, and I'll talk about the scenarios in a second. The second is to validate them, run workshops, and we did uh, six of those across the country, um, and develop this toolkit so that any Department of Transportation, any state or any planning agency can use this and hopefully get a better discussion with the users as well as the owners of the system. So what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is scenario planning itself and why we use it and how this all ties in. So like for any planning um, purpose, it really depends on what you're trying to do, the method that you use. So it really depends on the planning horizon. So the most common way to do any kind of forecasting or any planning is to do what's known as a point forecast. And this is usually done for a one year, one month, you know, one quarter, a short time frame out. And the idea is you look at your history, whether I'm forecasting uh, demand, uh, change in population, whatever, I look at the history, what's most current, and I project it. I might clean it up a little bit, and I might use a time series analysis to get some seasonality in it. I might use uh, regression to tr do some other factors. But they're all the same. I look at what's relevant in my past, in my current neighborhood in time, and I project. It's boxing. I box. I project today onto the future, maybe with some slight modifications. Now, some more sophisticated companies do risk management. They do range forecasts. So essentially, instead of just pointing to one, saying, this is the future, let's plan to it, they have a bigger glove. And they say, let's do high, low, and medium. We'll plan to that range. It's still the same thing. You're taking what's history. What's happening now, my, I'm a provincial in time, and I'm projecting it. So this works fine for short time frames, but the question is, what do I do for 10 plus years? I'm, I'm playing the Almeida Corridor. It's 1981. Madonna, I think, hasn't had a hit yet, right? <laughs> and I'm planning for something that won't go and move freight for 21 years. That's a hard thing. Can I just do a projection? It's hard. So this is one of my favorite charts. Um, it reminds me of when I had hair. It used to blow in the wind like that. Um, this is the price of oil. And it's from 1970 up to 2003. That's the dark line. Each of the colorful lines emanating out of that is a forecast, is the prediction of what fuel would be from that point in time. So the first one you see here is from 1981, and you can see the projections. So a couple observations. First, they're always wrong. All forecasts are wrong. It's, you know, it's the nature of the beast. But the important thing and the in issuing thing, interesting thing is why and how. So they're wrong in a couple of ways that I want to point out. First is that they're all linear. 
We're projecting like that. We're boxing, right? We're boxing for it. It's hard to, if you didn't have that linear, you'd have to say, well, something's going to happen. And then you're predicting an event, a step change. That's very hard to do. So generally, you kind of do a projection. And you might have a trend up a little, you know, something like that. But the other thing is the slope of the line. Notice when it's steepest versus when it's the most uh, shallow. It's steepest when it's the most volatile. What are they doing? It's like what we all do. These are, these are smart people. They're provincials in time. I'm looking at what's happening now, and that greatly influences what I have going forward. And so you might say, well, this was so last century. We're so much better now. We crowdsource. You know, we're so much better. The techniques. So every month, I look at the Department of Energy's projections for the number two diesel. This is the price of diesel on the road from, oh, wow, that's hard to read. From 2006, it's the dark line, up to last month. And then see all the colorful lines coming out. It's the same thing. Those are the projections made in January for the next 12 months. It's a hard thing to do. No matter how you do it, forecasting for fuel and many other things is very complicated. If you can't do a base input to supply chain, how can you do the, the final demand, which is even further removed? So the idea is going long term is very hard. And so why we have these techniques for short term, the forecasting, all these boxing techniques, they don't work for the long term. So what do we do? And the idea for scenario planning is we shift. Instead of trying to predict what's happening, try to pinpoint that forecast in the future, I focus my skills on preparing. Instead of predicting what's going to happen, I better prepare for a future. So what I do is I flip it. I say, OK, here's a future. What would you do today if future two, I told you, is going to happen? In 2030, the world will look exactly like this. You're no longer boxing. It's judo. You're reacting to the force. And you're preparing for that future. And what's interesting is if you talk to shippers, carriers, or any government planners, they're really good at planning. Tell them the requirements, and they can plan for it. So this plays to the strengths. So the idea is to shift away from trying to predict where something's going to happen to better prepare, to use those muscles, shifting from boxing to judo. There's one fatal flaw. What's that? You don't know what the future's going to be, right? That's the challenge. If I knew what the future's going to be, I could go back to the point forecast and say, oh, that's the future, and I can play into that point. We don't know that, so what do we do? Well, we have a challenge. We have the same problem that Jean-Luc Picard had. Um, this is from Star Trek. I'm talking to an MIT audience, so does anyone know the episode? No? Parallels. From November 93, seventh season of Star Trek Next Generation. As you all know, Worf came back from a tournament, and suddenly there were all these futures. Something was a little bit different. Why? It's because all the potential futures that could happen did. There's 285,000 different Starship Enterprises out there. This is the problem we face. As I try to plan for a state DOT or whatever organization, I have all these different futures out there. How do I determine which one to do? You can't do them all, and neither did Jean-Luc Picard, right? And so you've got to figure out what's the best way to do that. And so to do that, let's think about what these different futures can be. So if I look at some, there's, some, there's two main uh, primary types of futures that everyone talks about. So if I'm sitting now and I'm looking into the future, we all have this preferred future. This is the vision. This is uh, a good vision is President Obama's ink doubling uh, exports within five years. That's a vision. We want that to happen. That's my preferred vision. Another vision or another future out there is the probable one. You know, my prediction, what I think is really going to happen. You know, my best case, this might be me boxing, right, but it's what I think is going to happen. When you do scenario planning, you want to avoid both of these. This is a hard thing for people to get around. When I'm planning, why, don't, why do I want to avoid the, the place I want to be or the place I think is going to happen? And we'll talk more about it, but essentially the problem is if you plan for these two, anything else you say will be ignored because these are magnets. And you'll start, your, your mind gets anchored and you start planning for this and then you've defaulted to what? A point forecast that you're planning to. So the idea is to think about all these other possible plausible worlds and futures that are out there. And so what you want to do for scenario planning, you can't do them all, right? All 285,000, whatever of them. You pick a handful. You selectively pick a handful. Which ones do you want to pick? Probably ones that are far apart, the extreme points in a feasible region. Because you know the future of each one is probably not going to happen, but something in the middle probably will. Pieces of them will. So the idea is you stretch it out, 
and pick a handful that you think makes sense and really help illustrate the, uh, the question you're trying to answer. So if I look at this, there's some, this is a well-established uh, methodology, and there's some uh, rules for it. And so there's some pretty good uh, concepts about what makes a good uh, scenario, some criteria. And so if I go down these just really quickly, because this kind of helps set, we just don't pick these random futures. You design these, and I'll talk about the ones that we developed in a second. Um, first, they have to be geared to the decision you're trying to make. My decision is, where should I put freight infrastructure dollars today so that I achieve a certain world in 2037? If I was doing a, a, a scenario planning on pharmaceutical development, I'd have very different scenarios. Or the impact of demographics, very different scenarios. The scenarios I developed are all about how the freight flows would change. That's the name of the project, future freight flows. Um, they have to be plausible. I have to make sure that whatever I have in there is real. I don't have too many tractor beams, right, or things that are just not invented yet, or I don't assume world peace, right? So you have to make it plausible. There have to be alternatives. We talked about this. Um, you can't have the official and then, you know, the garbage scenario. This is why you don't want to go for that vision or you're predicted. You want to have ones that are equally likely and unlikely, equally likable, and dislikable. You don't want to have good scenario, bad scenario, because we're all people and we get attracted. They're magnets to the ones. You, you want to keep them apart and you don't want to have people default to be a point forecaster. They have to be consistent internally. Um, they have to be different. Um, you, you don't want to have them all right next to each other. You want to have them very different to stretch out that space. Uh, you want them to be memorable. Um, we give them funny names. Like I'll talk about Naftastique, which is one of the scenarios we have. Because after someone has gone through with this, the idea is they'll use that word as a touchstone. And they'll refer back to that. Because they talk about, wow, this looks like a global marketplace kind of world. And that means a lot. That means that maybe the future is heading in this path to this direction. So the names you give them are very important because they're memorable and they're used as touchstones later on by people who go through this. And they have to challenge. If, if it's just, yeah, this is what everyone thinks is going to be a consensus-based scenario, then it's a waste of time. So you want to challenge people push it out a little bit. Because the real thing is, the accuracy that we come up with is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether this scenario is ever going to happen. The exercise and the muscle we're developing is not how to predict the future, it's how to prepare. And so, whichever ones you do, you're exercising that muscle. Whether that event's going to happen or not, you're exercising. Your team, your group of people are exercising that muscle to determine, how do I prepare for this? Because as you prepare for these, then when the real future comes, you're used to preparing for a flexible amount of things. Um, so the focus also, something that's important, is to not focus on events that happen, but the effects that those events cause. And so this is something that's also a, a challenge because we want to forecast, and if we're going to forecast something, we have to forecast an event happening. And for scenario planning, you really don't care because a scenario is really just a bundle of events, random events that we made up of you know, a certain, you know, cleverly put together, but the idea is that from that, the users will glean out the effects on my system. So they learn that other muscle, in addition to preparing, is that they'll exercise, how do I glean out the effect away from the event? Let me just explain really quickly why this is important. Two examples. Anyone from Iceland who can pronounce this? It's the EYJ um, volcano. Happened in April 2010, and essentially what did it do? It closed down the air corridor over the Atlantic. So that's the event. No one that I know of outside of Reykjavik was predicting this. And if so, what the impact would be. But what's the effect? The effect actually is the same thing that happened in World War II, is that it was no longer possible to have trade across the Atlantic Ocean. So there are many other things. There could be a trade embargo. There could be many other events, but they have the same effect to a company, say, sitting in North America who supplies who has vendors in Europe. Another one, well, no one predicted the eruption. Everyone knew about the Olympics in Beijing. But what was the uncertain piece? You guys might remember, this was four years ago, and the idea was that pollution was so bad that they started having a moratorium on production several months out, and it kept getting bigger as the problem wasn't getting solved. So all of a sudden, they cut down a lot of production, and one of the things they cut down on is um, producing rubber gloves. And the rubber gloves, the majority of rubber gloves were produced within 100 miles of Beijing in 2008. And some of the companies that faced the biggest challenge were 
Subway. And those kind of stories, I mean, they use those gloves even more than pharmaceutical or, or uh, hospitals. So the idea is that this event we all knew was happening, there's still some uncertain element. And so all of a sudden, they couldn't source. If you're somewhere in the US and trying to source these rubber gloves, you couldn't get them. And so this is one event, but there are other things. I could have a pandemic, a trade war, a natural event, a disaster. All these other events trigger the same effect. So through scenario planning, what we try to train people to do is to separate out the events and just think about the effect. And for freight, we're very lucky because it's simple. Any event that you can think of that happens anywhere in the world, if I want to see how it affects my freight system, if I'm a, a shipper, a carrier, or a state DOT, there's only five things it can do to me. Wow, that's really horrible. So there's five things that it can do. There's a really cool graphic you can't see. Um, one is it can import the, impact the sourcing patterns, where I get stuff from. So think of the, uh, the volcano. I can't source from certain locations. An event could change my destination. So if I have a certain amount of uh, you know, change in population and demographics, it might change that I have more deliveries into a city, into major mega cities, or just the opposite. I could have an event that impacts my routing. That would, any of the events that I showed for the Beijing Olympics would do the same thing. It changes the way I route things in. It could change the volume either up or down. Or it could change the things that I'm shipping. And a good proxy for that is value density, the cost per ton or the cost per pound or cubic uh, volume. And the idea is that will either go up or down. Any event will trigger these changes. And these are the only changes that are relevant to me. So I no longer have to start worrying about all the different events that may happen. I have a lens of five events, or five effects, rather, that I'm paying attention to. So it simplifies things. So the whole thing for scenario planning is, remember, the reason why we do forecasting isn't to forecast. It's to plan to something. I need to know something to plan to. But the challenge with traditional planning or forecasting methods is that step changes happen over long terms. And so they're driven by events. We can't predict events. Um, but planners do a pretty good job of preparing. So the real thing that scenario planning does, it lets us shift from predicting events to preparing for potential effects. So that's a big mind shift that you don't have to start thinking about every possible event and predicting the likelihood and possibility. You're thinking about, OK, if a series of these things happen, how would that affect me? And how do I prepare for those? So this is like scenario planning in 15 minutes to kind of give you a sense of it. And so let's talk about what we did. We developed four scenarios. And we developed these over the course of about 12 months. We started with a kernel of an expert panel, and we subjected them to a lot of futurists. And so we had shippers, carriers, a bunch of different people, and get their opinions on things. Then that turned into a survey. We did a bunch of uh, focus groups. But we eventually sent down and said, OK, what are the critical uncertainties and the driving forces for future freight flows in the US? And what we came up with, I'm just going to go to the next slide, and I'll talk about each of these in a second, is that there's two main dimensions that drive everything we do for freight that has the big investment decisions. The first is the level of trade, right? Am I global or is it all local? And then the availability of resources. Is it highly restricted or is it easily available? And if you do that, you get a two by two, right? I love a two by two matrix. But the idea is you have these four extreme worlds. At one extreme, let's start with global marketplace. This is a world, it's like Thomas Friedman's flat world. You have high global trade. Migration, uh, borders, are, are, um, borders are porous, so people move around. There's a lot of trade. Everything's easily accessible, but at a price. Very volatile uh, costs here, commodity pricing, but the market really rules for global marketplace. Things are moving everywhere. Trade barriers are down. Um, but there's a lot of volatility. There are winners and losers in a market like that. So it's not a happy world, necessarily. At the opposite of that is Naftastique. Naftastique is a world where trading blocks emerge. China flexes its muscle, starts locking in a lot of countries with trade deals that exclude the United States. The US responds by creating a stronger um, trading community in North America, tying Canada and Mexico, some of Latin America in even more. So the world is moving to trading blocks. That's why I call it Naftastique. Right? And so there's a lot of trade within the blocks, but not so much between. So between, because you're tied to a block, Access to resources is a little limited, but there is trade within that area. One world order, this is one where there is a lot of global trade, 
but an event happens. And so the world comes together to have kind of a top-down approach to how to manage it. There's still a free market. It's not an invisible hand anymore. It's a hand in a velvet glove, maybe a green velvet glove. There's a lot of regulation and dictating of what can be traded where. So it's a very top-down approach to how free trade should operate. It's kind of in contrast to global marketplace. And then the last one is called millions of markets. And for this, technology really changes things. The U.S. becomes self-sufficient in terms of uh, energy through a combination of nuclear, sustainable, whatever new techniques or technologies that come out. And also manufacturing loses its economies of scale, whether it's through additive manufacturing or these other techniques. The idea is that having economies of scale where you need a massive plant goes down. You can achieve economies at a much smaller scale. So this pushes production much closer to consumers. So you have a lot of smaller communities. Second tier cities get a little bigger. Mega cities don't grow as much. So there's more of a move to urban areas at the second tier level. Very different world than the global marketplace. And as you can see, there's all these other different factors that we looked at. Uh, population dispersion, level of migration. You flesh these out. But whenever you put these scenarios together, the first thing you do is what are the critical factors and then you feather things in. You can't do it like a design of experiment and have 16 factors and try to do you know, every single one isolated. You just can't do that. Because remember what we're trying to do here. I'm trying to train people to better prepare, to be flexible. So I'm creating four future worlds, bundles of events, stories, that they can use to help prepare and, and become better at preparing and planning. OK, so what do we do with these scenarios? Well, we use them in workshops. We bring together all the different stakeholders. In our case, shippers, carriers, private sector, federal government planners. When we did this in Washington State, we made sure the tribal authority was there. Um, you bring whoever's critical for that area involved. Um, you have them consider a series of strategic options, alternatives, or investments. You subject them to these uh, scenarios, and you see what they come up with. We have a very structured way of doing that. Uh, we did six of these workshops, and we've actually done probably six additional ones outside of the project in places as far as Germany, um, Brazil, different places in the US for shippers, for carriers. So the technique is not tied just to government. You can use this for any organization that has to do long range planning. So we involved more than 300 people in the workshops we ran. Um, you can see the areas, very different. Of course, we went to Minnesota in February. Um, the Delaware, so it's in Pennsylvania. It'll go away. Um, Port of Long Beach for Port, and then a bunch of states. And then the last one we did was in Washington for national. So look at that as a whole. So how did we run each workshop? Well, they had a very set structure. We gave an overview, said here's what's going on, and then we had three main steps that we followed. The first is we immersed them. So we take the group, we divide them into four groups. Each group gets immersed in their scenario, and they say this is the world that happens in 2037. And we picked a common date, November 2nd, 2037, uh, for two reasons. One is having a weird date like that sticks in someone's mind more than 2040. And the second is we can always say the Boston Red Sox beat someone in the World Series in each one of the scenarios, because these have to be plausible scenarios. <laughs> so we have those. We immerse them. We have them evaluate different investments. We get feedback. Then we converge. So I'm going to talk for the rest of the talk how we run these and what we've come up and some of the insights that we've gathered so far. So for immersion, the real challenge for this, there's two challenges. The first challenge is to get people to free their mind to be open to a different world. Remember, we're all provincials in time. I'm so, what happens today is the thing that's going to be happening going forward. Excuse me. And so the idea is that we want to free them up so they're open for different worlds. And then we want to immerse them and make sure they believe this world. So there's two steps. So the first step that we try to get them to think beyond what they're thinking today is, let's talk about some examples in the past where we've been blindsided, where we look to the future with yesterday's eyes. Um, a great example is the 1894 horse manure crisis. Uh, 150,000 horses were in New York City right around the turn of the century. And they produced a lot of manure, a lot. All right? it, was, it was a major problem. And they had their estimates you can see published for both New York and uh, London about the hitting the third floor, nine feet. By the 50s, you know, the horse problems weren't really going to peak in the 1950s. Um, 
they, the first International Urban Planning Conference was held in New York City in 1894, and it was planned for 10 days, stopped after three, because they couldn't solve this problem. This was just the, the, the how do you solve this problem? Horses are pulling trolleys, people, it's the major form of transportation. The side note is, by this time, you know, 4,000 cars were already being sold in the U.S. This was not something that cars were some theoretical idea. They were in mass production already in Europe. By 1916, there were more cars than horses were already introduced. But it was so far out of what we, they were thinking, horses, 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 that it didn't even come up. Another example a little closer. Uh, Swiss watch. We still know what a Swiss watch is. It's the best watch, right? They dominated the market after World War II. Had 50% of the global market in 1960. Yet within 10 years, they had less than 10%. Because this new technology, this quartz technology, which is much more accurate, and so it, it moderates time much better, came out and they chose to ignore it because, you know, they're, they're, they know how to build watches. They've been doing it for centuries. And the U.S. and Japan really dominated. They said, oh, we'll do this. So that's why you see Seiko watches. And, and so the idea is, this is why it's called the quartz crisis or revolution. If you're from Switzerland, it's a crisis. If you're from Japan or the U.S., it's a revolution because you've changed it. The interesting thing is, it was developed by a Swiss engineer. So these are blind sites, and these aren't stupid people. You just have these ideas. You, you look at tomorrow with yesterday's eyes. And so it's a hard thing to break from. The other thing that people have a hard time with is that stuff doesn't change that fast. But it does. A lot can happen in a very short period of time. These are adoption curves, and you can see some of these. So, for example, if you look at uh, the VCR, this is about 1983. The adoption rate of VCRs in 1983, any guesses? 3%. It went up to almost 90% in six years. It's probably back at 3% again, right, for videotapes. But things can happen very quickly. Look at internet. And actually, slope's getting a little faster. So a lot of stuff can happen. Um, other areas for technology. Um, in 1980, when I was uh, graduating from high school, it would cost me about a million dollars. It'd weigh two tons. We'd have 20 gig of memory, 20 gig. 30 years later, I can... Uh, you know, I can get 32 gigs for about 100, and now it's so cheap, I didn't even bother updating it. We give this away as tchotchkes. I give away 30 gig things to people just for showing up at a conference. What used to take two tons. Not that long ago. Think of all the ramifications. This is the time frame almost between Almeida Corridor plan and actually execution, in the middle of its life cycle. But it's not just technology, economics, in global trade, um, in 1981, the majority of almost two-thirds, 60%, of all container traffic in the U.S. came from the East Coast. Within six years, it flipped, and it hasn't seen back anyway. So think of that. In six years, majority of flow went from East Coast to West, from West to East. What drove it? In 1980, China was our 24th trading partner in terms of uh, revenue, dollars, uh, total dollars. Slightly behind Switzerland, 1980. Now it's number... Two, right, behind Canada. A lot can happen in a short period of time. Um, industries can come and go in a short period of time. This movie, does anyone remember? You know, Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks, you got mail. She had the bookstore around the corner. He was the big bad Fox Books guy. What year did that come out? 98. 98. How many employees, how many border stores, borders bookstores were there in 2003? Anyone know? 1,250. That was the future, right? Borders bookstores. How many border stores are there now? They're in bankruptcy. 2011. So from 1998, when they were going to be the thing that was going to dominate and crush an industry, they're gone. Amazon started as an online bookstore. Now it does, you can buy books from Amazon, right? But it's not the primary driver of their revenue anymore. It's everything else. So it's totally changed. Blockbuster in, uh, started in 1985. In the 90s, a new store is opening every 17 hours. Where are they now? They were sold to Dish TV out of bankruptcy in 2010. Industries come and go. So this whole industry came, peaked, and went away. It was a darling, stock darling for a number of years. Now it's gone. 20 years is not a long time if I take something that takes 30 years to plan and build. Last one, my favorite, regulations, politics. So in 1980... Over the course of the next six years, a lot of regulatory acts were passed in the U.S. 
that deregulated transportation. So the net effect within 10 years was the average cost per, um, average cost per trucking went from a, dropped about 60%, or excuse me, almost 50% of what it was from an index of 100 in 1980 down to just south of 60% of that 10 years later. Think of the dramatic effect that has on flow of how things move. You know, no longer rail doesn't seem as useful anymore because the cost of trucking is so much lower. So things can happen very quickly. So we immerse them by telling them all these things and getting them open to suspending disbelief. Hey, stuff happens, stuff happens. But the real question is, how do I get them to believe this scenario, that naftastic is going to happen? And for that, we have to think a little differently. So each of us thinks a little differently about everything. And one good way of thinking about it is how analytical you are, which is the vertical axis, and how intuitive you are. And we know everyone here is highly analytical and intuitive, but generally you have strengths and weaknesses, and everyone is different. And so we want to reach everyone, because we're bringing all the different stakeholders together. So the planners and the shippers and the carriers, bringing them together, they don't all think the same. So you need collateral to help them get into the mood. So some people need a narrative. So what we created for each one of the scenarios are brochures. And the first thing in every brochure for each of the worlds is a one to two page description. Some people need that story. It tells what happened. It's kind of like reading a history of the future. But some people need tables and data, a lot of people in this room. And so we have a lot of charts and tables and graphs. So because some people don't believe it unless they see numbers. So we give them numbers of things like GDP change and price of commodities and things like that. What we don't do is show them, here's what the flow of traffic will look like. We did this for the first one, and it's a, it's a dangerous thing, because if you do too detailed, then you anchor them. You're essentially pointing them to a forecast instead of getting them to think. So you have to be careful about what data you give. We also do videos for the highly intuitive people that, you know, numbers and everything, those are fine, but I've got to feel it. I've got to have a gut feel. I want to see it, you know, get a sense of it. We created four newscast videos that try to capture that. So what we're trying to do is capture the highly intuitive people, whether they're analytically strong or not, the analytical people, whether they're intuitive or not. But then there's that fourth group, and these are the people that are low analytic, low intuitive. And honestly, when we talk with the states, be careful who you invite. <laughs> it's very careful, because you get these, and they'll drag it down, and we've seen it. When, and we'll talk about this at the very end. Um, but you bring different people in. So let me show you really just a snippet. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. Can you hear that? 2008. Concerted efforts by governments and markets lead to a slow but robust recovery. Due to reductions in regulation, global trade surges in terms of both volume and value. Price volatility becomes a big challenge. To manage it, a basket of global currencies replaces the US dollar as the international reserve currency. Most industries witness impressive growth. So there's a header for each one of these. It describes China, it, gives a narrative. Russia emerges new drivers. Of the each one is different. Along with the developed world. Liberal immigration reforms. But they kind of gives the highlights. It starts the immersive process. And movement of workers across the globe. This is the global marketplace world on November 2nd. And then we, at each one, we have a different newscast. And we try to have each one have a different feel. Good evening, citizens of the world. I'm Christine Lee, and welcome to World News in five minutes. So you notice all the, you know, you might think off, it's very fast paced, all the flags of the world. Where world leaders are gathering in Peshawar for a historical world summit. But we actually have something more interesting to talk about. This just into us last minute information. The corporate world has once again stolen the show. Roger Sharma, CEO of Tata, just announced that his group would be acquiring the consumer goods business of Procter & Gamble. That's pretty amazing, huh? The corporate world. While everybody expected the new leadership at Tata to awaken the peaceful giant, this acquisition has completely shocked. So I just want to show you a snippet. They're all available at YouTube. If you go to YouTube and, and look for FFF at MIT, just don't do FFF because weird things come up. Like, they're beyond my control. FFF, future prefos at MIT. All four of the scenarios are, uh, the newscasts are there. 
Why did we do that? There was so much bombarding of information. You probably saw the ticker across the top. Um, it's different in everyone. This is a very fast-paced world, global marketplace. If you look at One World Order, it's more like a 1970s PBS broadcast. People take a sip of water. It's, they talk about regulations. So each one of them is immersive. And they're trying to get to the, you know, how people feel about it. And the whole reason is to have someone, you hand them this world and say, this is what's happening in 2037. What are you going to do now? And they have to believe it. Because if they don't believe it, then, then the exercise is worthless. You've really got to immerse them. And that's why we spend so much time building those immersion tools at Collateral. So, OK, we immerse them. That usually takes about an hour, hour and a half. Then you subject them and say, OK, here are the things we're trying to decide. For each state, it might be different investments. For a company, it might be different strategies. Um, we give it to them, and we ask them to evaluate. So let me go through that. This is what we gave for the national one. We did this in June of 2011. And the idea is that for all the infrastructure, we didn't want to say, do you want to improve this highway or this? We had a very different approach, working with Tony First from Federal Highway Administration, who's kind of been a pioneer behind a lot of this. We broke all freight in, in, um, infrastructure into three categories. They're either gateways, things that bring it in, ports, air, sea, whatever. They're corridors, think highways, major trunk lines, class one rail, things that connect. Or they're connectors. They're things that go from the hinterlands into a corridor or from a port or a gateway into a corridor. So we broke all of the different infrastructure into these categories. And we had much more detailed discussion later on. But the idea is that you'll notice there's no mode. We're not talking about, do I fix the highways? Do I fix the, a specific port? It's really categories of things. And so we would have them here, and they, we'd ask them to vote. And because we're from MIT, we use chips. We use poker chips. And we give them out these poker chips. And the reason why, we could have them just write numbers down. But we found that people, when they're holding chips in their hand, they get more energetic. And what's the reason why we're here? We're getting people to brainstorm and to think outside the box. So having chips, they have to place, they're given a certain number, and they place bets. We usually have a big table, and they place where they think the important investment should be made. We also give them something a little different, um, the chip of death. They're given three veto chips. They have to veto something. This was the best thing we ever did. Um, you have to go through and say, yeah, I, I just don't like that, that option. So by doing that, you achieve a couple things. One is you force them to say no. It's not a strategy unless you say no to something. And we let them go up to three different ones. What we found, what's interesting is, private sector versus public sector. Private sector, no problem vetoing three things. No problem. They veto, don't want that, don't want that. Public sector, they don't like to say no. Nothing against that. They, don't, they, they like to say not today, <laughs> not this year. But they don't say no, because you know, things might happen. So we found it's very different, but we forced the veto chips to go because it brought out different insights. Um, for different rules, you have to use all your chips, all that stuff. We had them do it individually, and then publicly, and then they're allowed to change their vote. Very little movement, very little drift over the course of the workshops we've run. So, we immerse them, we have them evaluate separately, and then we bring them together. Because what we're doing here is we're diverging, brainstorming in the immersion, and now we're converging. We're going to bring it all back. Because what you don't want to do is leave people thinking that this world's happening and they're out in outer space. You want to bring everyone back. So you bring the group back, and what you do is you start seeing, OK, how did the different responses change? How were they different for each scenario? So this is, again, from the national one. So let me explain this complicated chart that uh, was developed by Shardul Fadness, who was a PhD student in ESD. He's done most of the work here. Every column is one of those investment decisions. The last one is feeder lines to corridors, intermodal, gateways, whatever. So each column. Above that line are the percentage of positive votes that were received in each scenario. So you see blue is global marketplace. The gray is um, millions of markets. Red is Neftastique. Green is one world order. And you can see how they differ. The negative votes, same thing, shows the percentage. And then if you bring these all down, we just bring them all down, what we're going to do is compare and contrast. Because we want to identify three or four different types of investment decisions. The no, no um, brainers, the ones that make sense no matter what's happening. So for this, working at gateways that tie production, that's a no brainer. Every scenario made sense, worth exploring further. Then we look for no gainers. And these are the ones that kind of make sense, 
Let's see, where's one? Here. But it wasn't you know, totally strong in each. We set a, an arbitrary threshold they had to go above. But it didn't hurt in any scenarios. Then there's the ones that are, you know, uh, sorry, those are no regrets. The no gainers are the ones like, here we go, international airports. I'm sorry for anyone from Aero. Um, it was not seen important here in most of the scenarios. Now, it could be the mix of the people we had. But the idea is you identify the things that make sense, don't make sense, and then the really interesting ones are the ones that make sense in some, but don't make sense in all. Like East Coast water ports. Made sense in all, but naftastic. Remember, that's a trading block one. All your travels north-south. Working on the coast doesn't make as much sense. So here, we introduce something called a sensor in the ground. When do I know, as my future moves along, that we're drifting to, to Naftastic or to global marketplace? And so sensors in the ground are flags that tell me the world's drifting in this way, so maybe I want to use that real option. I want to use that design. But I wait for those sensors to tell me which way to go. And so part of this whole process was developing, OK, if these are the decisions you're going to make, when do I know it's the right decision to make? What should I be paying attention to now that I haven't been paying attention to in the past. And so this is how you bring it all together and tie it all up. So that's the workshop. Let me just have two slides really quickly about what we've learned so far. Um, so for the process itself, originally we we're going to train people, you know, train the trainers and have DOT uh, personnel do this. Didn't work as well. They know they're planning the key uh, skill needed is to be able to facilitate. And so we really highly recommend them bringing in someone else to do this. We also found, as I alluded to earlier, attendee selection is critical. You've got to pick who you want there, because it's a brainstorming session. Um, positive negative voting work. Uh, debriefing in the same day is tough. And so we're encouraging them to spread this out and do it a little further uh, apart, spending a little more time. Um, insights for the outcomes. We found that the connections were almost always robust across all the different scenarios. Um, what's interesting is very few people said, you know, just invest in the highway system or just this. It's really connections of the different systems. So it kind of led us to really think that what's, what needs to be developed in the U.S. are the connections between the systems, not the main trunk lines. And that uh, also what came out is the flexible use of existing facilities. So in some of these, some of the decisions were not build this or build that, but invest in a different way, maybe add capacity through smart highway. And so the whole idea of flexibility was very strong across all the different scenarios. And there are some strong uh, perceptions for each of the scenarios. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is what we're doing now. Um, three, three areas that we're working on going forward. One is, how do you pick these sensors in the ground? And so there's two schools of thought. One is, I determine 10 metrics and I follow them. And so we're doing that with the uh, DOT. But another one is say, you know what? What we really want to do, this is all about flexing muscles, right? getting people used to this stuff. Instead of telling them what the sensors are, because if I really knew that, then I know what's going to happen, because I know what to watch for. What I really want to do is get people to start thinking about stuff that happens and classifying. So what we did, we did a pilot of this where we sent out weekly polls, and, people, and we uh, said, OK, does this event think you're shifting to Naptastique or further away? Closer to millions of market or further away? And by this, we're trying to get a sense of what people thought, and they were learning to classify an event and thinking, how does that affect me? So that's something else we're going to continue to work on and go through. Uh, another one is how people change the way they think if they go through this. If this is just an event that's fun for a day, you get a free lunch, and you go away, then it's a waste of time. Uh, Shardul Fennis is doing his doctoral dissertation, looking at this specifically, how it changes the way people think, and some initial thoughts that it does lead to more flexible thinking. And does somewhat, and they're still working on these results, lead to more uncertainty. Once you see all these possible changes that are out there, you're less fixed to the, your preconceived notion. Because you know, once you've been to Paris, you can't go back to the farm. And so the idea is it expands to what people look at. And so we're continuing to work on that. And Shardell's put a lot of good work into that. And the last one is how you tie this in. Anyone who's worked in a state DOT knows they have a very set process, and unfortunately, there are 50 of them in the US. Every state is different. But they generally follow a planning from long range to a transportation um, improvement plan to a state transportation improvement plan. And so the question is, how do we fit this in? Uh, we had a master's student who did a thesis combining this. Uh, the state of Washington is actually incorporated. 
scenario planning into their long-range planning process. So we're working on that, but it's a hard thing to do. And so we're trying to work on how frequently should you do this and how do you tie this together. And with that, I think that closes it. So thank you very much, and I think I have three minutes for questions. You guys just want to get out. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.